Hi, everybody. I'm Lawrence. I'm an AI advocate on the TensorFlow team, and I'm here with my colleague and friend, Jason. Hi there. I'm Jason, and I'm a developer advocate on TensorFlow.js. So here, we're going to try to answer the questions that you post on social media with the hashtag AskTensorFlow. So why don't we just get right down to it? Sounds good to me. First up, we have Ad Kumar, who asked, how do we extend KRS APIs, model subclassing, and generally improve the ease of use? Oh, wow. That's a great question. And it's one that we get a lot. Because uh, if you are new to TensorFlow, you probably are thinking, it does everything that I need to do in training models and all of that kind of stuff. But then once you get a little bit more advanced into TensorFlow, you realize that sometimes you're trusting some code that was written for you by somebody else. And you want to be able to subclass that. Yeah. You want to be able to override that. You want to be able to customize it, like custom training loops and that kind of thing. And that's a relatively advanced thing that you want to do, but a very important one as you get more advanced, particularly in research. So uh, we've realized that the training and the information for this is kind of scattered all over the place. There's lots of files. I think the original question, he mentioned that there are over 100 files. Wow. And I haven't counted them, but um, I'm sure there are quite a few. So I'm actually right now hard at work at trying to put all of this together and produce a training course for advanced TensorFlow and advanced Keras. So teaching you some of that stuff, such as subclassing some of the classes that are there, creating custom training loops, and all of that kind of thing. So that you really, I like to see it as like you know driving stick instead of driving automatic. And uh, so we're working on that. We're hoping to get it published in the next few months. So just uh, watch out, and we'll and uh, hopefully you'll have something that you can enjoy. So next question. Um, this is one for you, Jason. Excellent. So I O six two eight nine eight zero one nine. That's a great <laughs> handle. Uh, asked, what about web developers, and particularly web developers who are new to AI and machine learning, and they want to get started with all of this, but do they have the technology to help them? Indeed, we do, and that's why I'm here. Uh, we actually have TensorFlow.js, which is our JavaScript implementation of TensorFlow. And that ha means you can basically run it anywhere that JavaScript can run. So that might be client side in the browser, in Node.js on the server side, on Internet of Things like Raspberry Pi. And we've just announced support for React Native as well, so Ooh. even in native app development, which is pretty, oh, pretty neat. That's new to me. I didn't know that. <laughs> wow, cool. Um, and then, of course, if you are really um, prone to using Python, you can actually still use that. And we have a command line converter that allows you to convert the Python saved models into a TensorFlow.js format, which you can then use in all of those environments as well. I love how you say prone to using Python. <laughs> <laughs> so, but which, which is one of the really nice things that, like with TensorFlow.js, where it's, you can train it in the browser. Yes. Right. Exactly. It's not just for the data scientists that do Python and all that kind of stuff. So, you, if you're a JavaScript developer, you don't have to learn something new. You can actually do your training That's right. there. You can stick to what you're used to, I guess. And yeah. There are some caveats if you're going client side or server side. So, if you've got smaller models, they work very well on the client client side, and you get other features like privacy and such as well. And if you want to train larger models, then Node.js works just as well as Python does and can do all that hard, heavy lifting for you Nice, too. nice. Yeah. And, and one of the things I really mm -hmm. liked about it when I started playing with it was that if I'm a JavaScript developer who hasn't learned Python, but I have teammates you know, who've been building models in Python for a long time, yeah. there's a converter. Yes. Right? Exactly. It converts the model into like a JSON object notation, and then I can start using yeah. that, load my interpreter, and, and totally. off I go, which is kind of cool. And another fun fact, if you are using Node.js, um, you can actually run saved models without conversion in Node, Ooh. but you can't use them on the front end. So if you are just sticking to, sticking to server side in Node.js, then you can run Python models without conversion now. And they actually run slightly faster because of a just-in-time compiler, which is very cool. Very <laughs> nice. Cool. I'm learning a lot today. Thanks, Jason. Awesome. So and also one thing that just a shameless self plug, I hope you don't <laughs> mind, but like a lot of this stuff around TensorFlow.js when I got excited about it and I decided to put together a course to teach. Of course. Yeah. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm one of those who's prone to Python. So uh, <laughs> I, I did it from that perspective, like for people who um, not necessarily just JavaScript developers, sure. but people who are Python developers who are used to building ML, just to see how easy it is to do stuff in the browser. And we yeah. got some cool projects they can play with. And, awesome. And yeah. it's all on Coursera if they want to check it out. I have to take out. that one as well. Yes, please. Yes. I need Need all the students I can get. So, <laughs> so uh, actually, another question oh. for you. And this one comes from Isbelen Erdem. And uh, they ask Are there any TensorFlow.js transfer learning examples, in particular for object detection? That's a really good question. That's something I was looking into when I first joined the team a little while ago. Um, before I answer that, though, I just want to talk a little bit about object detection and what that is versus image detection. So object detection is essentially the ability to recognize one or multiple objects in a given image and also find their locations with little bounding boxes. That's different to uh, image detection, which essentially allows you to know if something is in an image but not where it is, and also typically for one thing only. Um, 
So now we know that, um, how do we do it in TensorFlow.js? Well, I think the easiest way to do this is actually to use Cloud Auto ML, which now supports exporting the custom train models you make from there to TensorFlow.js format. Okay. And of course, with that, you can then use that anywhere as we discussed before. Um, you can check out the documentation to get started that online. Um, but essentially, all you need to do is um, have a folder full of images, like cat images, and then a CSV file that has the coordinates of the bounding boxes for each image, showing where the cat is in each image. And that is then used as the training data to retrain the model to then work with your data. Um, you then download that and then use it as, as you need to. OK, so, yeah. that's pretty cool. So instead of like you building a transfer learn model yourself, you're using an existing online model and having Cloud or AutoML Exactly, that. yeah. If doing this in TensorFlow.js for something like Coco SSD might be a little tricky unless you have access to the full model, the original model, if you will. Um, so if you don't have access to that, you can just leverage Cloud AutoML instead. So yeah. check out the Cloud AutoML documentation on that. Definitely, details. sounds good to me. Cool, should we go to the next question? Let's do it. OK, so next up we have Conrad WT who asks, does TensorFlow leverage Metal when running on Mac OS? I take it they mean iOS and not Mac OS? Ah, uh, yes. True. All right. So it's, uh, there are a number of ways that you can use Metal on iOS. The simple answer is yes, you can. So uh, with TensorFlow Lite, there's a thing called a GPU delegate that allows you that some mobile devices have access to GPU, some mm -hmm. do not. On iOS, of course, it's, it's more common to have access to the GPU. So with the GPU delegate in TF Lite, you can actually access effectively access Metal, which gives you um, the ability to run inference using the GPU so you can have much faster inference on the, on the device Very itself. Useful. Yeah. Super useful, mm -hmm. faster inference means you're using less battery life, means you're more responsive with your application yeah. and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. It's a bit complex to go over all of that here in this uh, sure. in this video, but I would say check out the tensorflow.org slash light site or uh, search for GPU on that site as well, and you'll see all the details. There's a whole bunch of stuff, and there's including some sample apps showing you how you can enable it and how you can use the GPU delegate so that you can just have a little bit of fun using your GPU to do faster inference on mobile, not just Metal and iOS, but also things like the Neural Network API and Android. Nice, yeah. very cool. So the next question that came in was from Rishav16. And they asked, what's the best way that someone like a high school student could engage with TensorFlow and could learn maybe some of the basics around ML and start doing some real things? And then from that, then be able to move on to the different components and submodules for their projects and their work. And Sounds good. It's a good yeah. way for a high schooler to get started. Yeah. So I guess when you're starting out, you want to kind of try something a little more uh, graphical to get started, <laughs> to just learn how things uh, need certain amounts of training data and what biases might come into this kind of uh, situation. So I recommend checking out a um, website called Teachable Machine, which is made by Google. And it allows you to simply point your webcam at various objects, or maybe use a microphone, whatever you want to use, mm. um, and train on that data. And within about one minute, you can have a, a machine learning model that can classify speech or objects uh, and even poses, which is pretty pretty cool. Right. So <clears throat> very quickly, within the browser, being able to put something together so they yeah. can just see how machine learning models work. Exactly. And they can try it live after the model's trained. They, the webcam will be fired up. And you can then repoint it at the things you're training on and see the class it predicts right there in the browser in real time, super low latency. Um, and if you like it, if it's, if it's actually useful to you, you can then download that model. It's just a JSON file, essentially. Uh, which you can then reuse on any web website you want to deploy that on, essentially. Nice. Yes. What a great way to get started. Very cool. <laughs> I wish they had that back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> like last yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, we have one Amar Vind who asks, what are TensorFlow records, and why are they needed for input? That's a great question. And to understand why you need TensorFlow records, you have to kind of double click a level above that and think about data. Right? Data is really the lifeblood in training any kind of machine learning application. But data comes in all shapes and sizes. That's very true. Right? There might be a zip file over here with images. There might be CF CSV files. If you are um, if you are inclined to be a JSON person, <laughs> uh, you you might be JSON files. Those kind of things. And it's it's um, without having a lot of uh, skills and being able to understand this, it becomes a huge learning curve for people to say, okay, which one am I going to use? How am I going to use yeah. it? How do I unzip? How do I use JSON? How do I? And it, it just it, 
And when I've seen like a lot of people building models, you might have like this much code for building a model, but this much is the model architecture, sure, yeah. and this much is like downloading the data, figuring out it, figuring it out, putting it into formats like uh, I'm Python inclined, I'm putting <laughs> it into the, like you know NumPy format so that I yeah. can do training, or if I'm it's JS, putting it into JSON sort of tensors so that yeah. I can do training and that kind of, and that's a whole amount of calories that I have to burn just before I before I can even get started. That's very true. So yeah. the idea behind uh, TF Record and something called TensorFlow Data Services and TensorFlow Data Sets is to try and make that as easy as possible. So what we've done is we've taken a whole bunch of different data sets mm -hmm. and put them into an API so that with one or two lines of code, you have everything that you need to start training. Very cool. So now instead of going from this with this much for your data, you're going from this to this with only this much for your data. Very nice. If yeah. that visualization works OK. Mm -hmm. And uh, so things like that. And then the, the core of that is the TF record. Um, so you need to have that one kind of that base class from which you can do everything. And then when you're doing that, there's all of these different optimizations for training. Like if you're doing distributed training and you want to manage pipelines. And I always like to think about it as like, say, take for example, you have a CPU and a GPU and you're going to do your training on the GPU mm -hmm. where you do all your data pre-processing on the CPU. Right, so the CPU is grabbing the data and handing it to the GPU. And then while the GPU is working, the CPU also has to be doing something. And to get the two of these to work in parallel can be very difficult. Sure. So there's a lot of pipelining technology in uh, TensorFlow. And that is built to use TF Record to be able to manage all that I data. See. Very, so very neat. You know, it, it seems like one small thing. And you might think, well, why on earth would I want to use this when I've got CSV or I've got <laughs> databases or I've got all of that kind of thing? But once you start using it in that way, it, you'll see it, it has great benefits for your training. Awesome. So that's it. Great questions. It was a lot of fun answering them too, right? It was indeed. So uh, don't forget on social media, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you like, hashtag Ask TensorFlow, and we'll do our best to answer those questions. And Jason, I think some of the stuff you spoke about today, you'll have online demos for. Right? Indeed. We've got some live demos, and we're going to publish those uh, for you guys to see at home, because it all runs in the web browser after all. That's one of the nice things about JavaScript. Indeed. <laughs> all right. So thank you, and we'll see you around. Mm -hmm.